Good morning. And welcome to Pasadena's beautiful Central Library. I'm Terry Tornick. I'm the mayor of Pasadena, and I'm delighted to have you all here today. We are here uh, for the specific purpose of congratulating Pasadena Transit for 25 years of service. Staying in business these days for 25 years is an achievement uh, for anybody, and I think that um, uh, the role that Pasadena Transit is playing now in the lives of, of people in the city uh, is really continuing to emerge and grow, and, and as we look forward and we begin to try to act on our general plan principle of making uh, mobility possible for people without a car, um, I think we all understand that Pasadena's transit's role will continue to grow and, and uh, we're so grateful for all the hard work that people do associated with that. Um, I think it's going to be interesting, there's legislation pending now in uh, Sacramento, as you know, to, uh, to create free fare, a free fare situation for students. Actually, there are a couple of different versions. Uh, some for, for uh, uh, young students, uh, some for all students, some for people who used to be students. Um, so I think it, it's one of those uh, great Sacramento um, uh, ideas that doesn't come with any money. So um, it's a terrific idea. We can all get behind it. The only question, as always, is how do we pay for it? Uh, but, but I think the fact that there will be active discussion among people who frequently don't pay much attention to public transit is a real plus. It's an opportunity for us to identify the role that public transit plays uh, and the reality of what it means to us and what it can mean moving to the future. So I'm excited about it. I'm glad that it's getting attention. Um, and I think that the outcome as always remains uncertain. So we have an interesting program uh, today, which I'm anxious to get to. Um, but before that, we do have a couple of um, uh, people from our congressional offices. We have Lauren Jacobs uh, from, from uh, Congresswoman Chu's office and Michael Aguiera Godet from Congressman Schiff's office. I wonder if you'd be willing to come up. We can do a collective certificate presentation and move this along. Do we have anybody from uh, Catherine Barger's office or uh, Senator Portentino's office or Chris Holden's office? Okay, we just have the federal recognition. <laughs> so we will do the requisite photograph, just one moment. Thank you for coming. So we'll all make the transition to the elbow, uh, <laughs> the elbow bump as opposed to the, we've got to set good examples for people. Um, and uh, it's not correct that everyone here will have to be tested for the virus when, when we leave the auditorium, but, but we are being mindful about maintaining people's uh, uh, personal space. We have a couple of, of my colleagues here today, Andy Wilson from District 7, and we have, uh, I'm about to introduce uh, our next speaker who has been very active in all things uh, transportation, Council Member Margaret McAustin. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Um, thank you. I, uh, I'm so happy to be here today, and I think it's, it's really kind of exciting that um, yesterday, be, yesterday being um, International Women's Day and today being the 25th anniversary celebration of Pasadena Transit, it's a very, it's a very relevant intersection of those two events because what we are seeing every day is more and more women in transportation and as we see more women in transportation and at the higher levels of transportation, it's changing the way transportation works because women are at the table and women are making decisions. In Pasadena, for example, 
about 58% of the riders of Pasadena Transit are women. And when we look at services like the Pasadena Transit, these are the services that often serve the neediest in our community. For example, 80% 80 80 of those women don't have cars. These are you know, women that are often heads of families and they're heavily reliant on public transportation to meet the everyday needs of their, their families and, and to participate in their community. So it's up to us as public officials and transportation leaders to ensure that we are serving the neediest in our community and we are ensuring that the students and the women and the lower income folks in the community have access to frequent bus service. So I'm very excited today that um, so many, I think all of the women on our panel, all of the panelists today are women and so we get a, a unique perspective about that today. And so with that, I would like to um, introduce our keynote speaker, Meghna Khanna. Meghna is the Senior Director with the Mobility Corridors Department at LA Metro. She manages and oversees environmental and design of various light rail transit projects, including the West Santa Ana Branch, the Rio Hondo Confluence Station Feasibility Study, the Arts District 6th Street Station, and others. Meghna managed the Green Line extension to Torrance and was the deputy project manager for Airport Metro Connector. She was part of the LA Metro Women and Girls Governing Council 2017 and co-led the Understanding How Women Travel study. Before coming to LA Metro, Meghna was a senior associate with Gruen Associates and has written for American Planning Association magazine and is a frequent speaker at planning and design conferences. Please join me in welcoming Meghna Khanna. Thank you, Councilwoman. Thank you, City of Pasadena, and congratulations for the 25th year of transit. I'm very excited to be here to share my study understanding how women travel. Um, I have to say, as a Councilwoman mentioned, I was part of the Women and Girl Council at LA Metro in 2017. Uh, this was the first year the council was established by our CEO, Phil Washington. And uh, this was basically done to look at Metro policies and program from a gender perspective. The Metro has a workforce of 11,000 employees and 29% of those are women. Uh, interestingly, that 29% has stayed 29% since 1970s. And we are in 2010. So we are 2020 almost, so we, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. So we wanted to look at metro programs and policies from a gender perspective. This is a volunteer group. It includes 60 metro employees, non-contract, contract employees, and we apply a gender lens at Metro as an employer. What is Metro doing to bring more women into the workforce? Metro as a service provider, what can we do to make the metro transit system better for women and girls? And Metro as a catalyst for economic development, how can we attract more women-owned businesses to come and work for Metro? I was part of the Metro as a service provider group looking at how can we make our transit system better and safer for women? So we started looking at statistics, which was 54% of our bus riders and approximately 52% of our rail riders are female, and women are more dependent on public transit. These were the key statistics that we got out of just the general data that Metro had. We had very big ideas. We wanted to look at our travel demand model, introduce the idea of women take all these trips for caring for children, caring for elderly. We need to re-look at a travel demand model, work with FTA. Those were the big ideas we were starting to look at. 
And suddenly, we reach out to our data managers at Metro who were managing the data sets, which included express lanes, our customer survey, all these different data managers. We did a quick survey. What did we find? Not most of the data was separated by gender. Not most of that data was currently being used to improve services for women. And to be honest, we did not even have enough data to understand how women were using our system or what were the challenges they were facing on our systems. There was not enough data to identify those key policies. And this is where, uh, as part of that group, I came up with this idea that we need to first collect that data to understand how women were traveling on our system and the idea for this study came about. This was presented to our CEO, and the CEO asked us to move forward with the study. And why is it so important for Metro? I think for the longest time, we haven't even tried to understand how women are traveling, so all that travel behavior, travel patterns have been lost. And it's just going back to, we get what we measure, perhaps what you measure is what you get. So it's like we don't have data, so we don't understand how women are traveling. So, and the reason we wanted to do this was to shift from the gender neutral planning that has been happening for the longest time to gender responsive planning. And again, focus on the most valued customers, which are women. How did we approach this study? We actually wanted to frame this study by the key core social justice issues. And we wanted to look at existing data through literature review, metro key data sets. We looked at the National Household Travel Survey, the California Household Travel Survey. But then we wanted to apply a non-traditional and traditional methods, including some conventional data methods and innovative methods using the ethnographic principles. And I'll get into more details uh, for these methods. For the conventional method, we, of course, did a survey. This was a new survey that we did for this study. We oversampled women. Uh, this survey reached out to 2,500 participants. Out of that, 1,600 were women. Uh, we aimed to get representative samples by income, race, ethnicity. And we aimed to get diversity in the age groups and diversity in transit use. So we reached to Metro current riders, previous riders, and people who are not currently using Metro. So we tried to do this survey and collect information from a diverse group. And just to give you an idea, this online survey reached out to 400 zip codes. And the key themes that we were trying to explore through this survey were what are the travel mode choices? What are the regular trips that you're making? What is the perception of safety of transit? And this was a key topic we hear over and over again, concerns about tr safety and challenges to using trans transit. And also we wanted to hear more about the first last mile connection points. We also conducted focus groups. We conducted three focus groups, two with women, one in English, one in Spanish. And we also conducted one focus group with men. We tried to keep these separate because we wanted to get into these sensitive topics like sexual harassment and safety. So we wanted to make women feel comfortable talking about these things. So we reached out to 90 participants using this focus group. And again, the way people were selected in this focus group, we tried to keep like a diverse range, high income, low income, non-riders, riders. And uh, women with children also participated in this survey. Uh, these were the key themes that we tried to explore, and I have to say, just to give you an example, key differences. Same questions were asked for the women and the men. Um, we asked women, uh, what do you do generally to feel safe on metro system? And women said, oh, maybe we dress differently, or we carry a bag closer to us. <clears throat> we asked men, what do you do to make yourself feel safer on transit? We carry pepper sprays. We sometimes carry knife. And then we heard women telling us, we are afraid of men who carry pepper sprays and knives on the system. <laughs> there you go. So it was very interesting that how the same questions were being, women 
most of them mentioned how they have difficulty carrying all these bags and strollers, and they have to take all their parents elderly, so wheelchair becomes a problem. Men, they just talk, talked about that A to B trip, work to home, home to work, and was like, no, it's not that challenging. I hardly take my kids on the transit. So it was very interesting the kind of perception we got out of these focus groups. For innovative methods, these methods were targeted towards reaching those hard to reach population groups. Because uh, we've noticed that surveys, yes, it was an online survey, can only reach certain people. So this was participation observation. We worked with our experts in ethnographic and created that sheet that you see right there, which has diagrams of our rail vehicle, the bus, buses. And basically, our project team went and surveyed 19 different bus routes and rail routes. And it was almost, we made 2,500 observations, spending more than 100 hours on riding our system, just to see when women enter our buses or when women enter our rail car, where do they tend to sit? Are they taking the aisle seat? Are they uh, sitting closer to the driver or do they go in the back? And also, how are they entering the buses or rail cars? Are they entering the first rail car or the one in the middle? Just to understand the behavior through observation. So this was just trying to see how women, when they are in this public environment, how are they responding to that public environment? And of course, I have to mention this, we weren't stalking people as we were doing this. It was just an observation. These workshops, participatory workshops, we try to um, partner with CBOs. We try to reach women with disabilities, women experiencing homelessness, and women who are immigrants. So we went out to different centers. We went to the downtown uh, women homeless center. And as part of this uh, participatory workshops, we just asked one question to these women, saying, what does public transportation mean to you? And instead of just making it more like, you know, Q&A session, we gave them these tools. We gave them like photographs, cutouts, so that they could create a collage. Because again, these are women, you know, they have a different perception of transit. And we wanted them to just engage in this exercise. And this helped them open up more and tell us their, about their experience. And I have to say, I did cry at these participatory workshops, because the one in downtown center, they mentioned transit is their lifeline. If it wasn't for transit, they don't have a place to be. They travel from every place. They knew more about LA County than we did. They knew more about the transit lines than we did. And it was really good to hear from them. And a lot of children also participated in their, um, this exercise with moms who were part of this uh, participatory workshops. Pop-up engagements were conducted at our three key transfer stations, Rosa Park, North Hollywood, and El Monte. And we just asked people two key questions. What makes riding transit easy? What makes it difficult? And it was just people getting off and on. And we tried to do it in English and Spanish and Chinese. So we had interpreters. And people were able to either post post-it notes, or if they wanted an interpreter, we were able to get those information. So we actually did get almost 300 to 400 uh, different responses using these pop-up engagements. So after collecting all this information, we categorized our finding in these key topics. As you see, safety is one of the key topics, but these were the key topics. Um, the overall travel behavior, this is not transit, it's just travel behavior, looking at national and uh, California household survey. Across all modes, women in and men in the LA region make around 3.5 trips. But just to point out one key thing, more women than men make seven or more trips per day. So women are traveling more. They're making more trips per day or are not making any trips a day, per day. So either women are more exposed to all these travel burdens or they're more isolated. So this is like a key thing that I do want to point out. Um, also, overall travel behavior, women are making multiple short trips. They are taking children to school, other activities, or they are accompanying someone in care. Um, men and women, women tend to travel likely outside that rush hour. So this is 
typical for all modes. Women are making more trips outside that rush hour, so I just want you to hold on to that thought as we go into the transit behavior. So for transit behavior, again, as we conducted our survey, we found more women are riding our public transit system. And this key figure, I feel like this could be another highlight for any article. Um, more women, our women ridership on bus and rail keeps increasing. Since 2010, we have noticed more women riding our rail and bus system. And men ridership tends to keep declining. So again, why are we focusing on understanding how women travel? There's your answer. More women are using a system, so we need to focus on how they are using our system. <clears throat> Almost 90% of female riders who are using a system uh, take transit three days per week. So more women are using our system than men. Women, as I mentioned, even on transit, they are likely to travel during the midday, 12 to 4, again, because they are taking kids to school or taking them back or accompanying the elderly to those uh, doctor's visit or <clears throat> doing household errands. And this peak, generally it peaks at 2 p.m. So that's the peak when our frequencies generally drop. So between the day when women are traveling, our frequencies are not matching up to the travel behavior. And this is something I do want to point out. We are doing a next-gen bus restructuring study. This was something they also found out. So it's a good point for us to realize that we need to readjust our service frequencies. On transit, women are traveling under 10 miles, and they're making more short trips. Again, very consistent with the overall travel behavior, but women are traveling more during the day, making these short trips, trip chaining. So we need to relook at and think about our fare policies because women are making these short trips which do not meet with our fare policies, that $1.75, which is limited to the two-hour transfer. So those are the questions that we are hearing over and over again as we look at these numbers. Overall transit behavior, more women are traveling with children. We notice 57% of our female riders, they bring children on our transit system, and 79% disagree that riding the bus with children is easy. So again, that's another thing that we need to relook at. I have to mention right now, our policy has been revised, and I, we do take credit for our study. Uh, earlier, um, transit uh, patrons were told to fold the stroller before entering the bus. So imagine, a woman juggling her kid, the bags, the stroller, and entering the bus. So now, strollers are welcomed onto our system. It's just that there's no room. Once you enter the bus, the aisle space is so small that the stroller doesn't even fit in there. So that's another thing. But I do want to mention that policy has been revised. Safety was a key concern. Safety, 86% uh, of women, though, safe, feel safe riding the bus, and 78% feel safe while riding the transit. And this is just the general numbers. But I do want to point out, when we did different survey methods, parent, previous, and never ridden metro riders, women kept pointing out to the same thing. I don't feel safe. I don't feel safe. Men, they had issues with transit, being slow, or it didn't go where they wanted to go. But women, for women, transit was not working because they didn't feel it was safe. And top changes that women wanted to make uh, had less to do with technologically, technological solutions. They were saying, yes, we understand you have a CCTV cameras, you have cameras at bus stops. But we, rather, we actually feel safe when there's that one bus driver on the bus. So this is an interesting question as we think about you know, bringing more transit security onto a system and transit security, having more people on the uh, transit system, having more eyes, it's a great thing. But transit policing is a very sensitive topic. Our transit system goes through a diverse neighborhood so we have to be very careful. Over-policing can result in creating more issues where people stop riding our system. But at the same time, we have to get creative to have more eyes on our system and address this sensitive topic. 
One thing I do want to point out, uh, women do feel safe riding a system during the day. Generally, those percentage, whether they were riding the system, waiting for the transit, or um, go, doing that first last mile, were in the range of 50 to 60 percent. But that number drops to less than 20 percent during the night. So it is a big concern. Safety during the night is a very big concern for women. And I have to say, sexual harassment plays a big, big, big reason why they don't feel safe. Our sexual harassment complaints have gone up in the past six months. And it could, you know, it also has to do in light with what's happening nationwide with the Me Too movement. But women are feeling more empowered to come out and report. But at the same time, I have to say, we did see a drop in 2015, 2016 when we came out with a sexual harassment campaign. So I think it's maybe re-looking at a campaign again, also empowering women to provide information without, being, without feeling being harassed again, because I think that's what we have heard over and over again when they report it. The way the police reacts, it really makes them feel like they are being harassed again. So this is a key topic that we are going to look into when we get into the safety measures. Access, one thing I do want to point out that more women riders, be it on bus or rail, they are living under poverty. They are making less than 35,000 per year, and this is a core group of our transit riders. And we do have a life program which offers monthly passes to people making less than 35,000, but that monthly pass is $110. That's a lot of money. So that's something we heard over and over again, that $110 upfront cost is too much for them. They said they would rather buy daily passes because they don't know if they'll be able to afford this. So I think, again, that's another concern that we heard, so we would be looking into that. One thing I do want to point out, again, going back to the thing, these are the complaints. We heard more women complaining about strollers than men. Of course, because more women are bringing their kids onto the system. Uh, for reliability, I have to say 25% of the current female riders identify travel time re reliability as a top concern. And they want to make sure that when they are at the stop, bus stop, there is no pass up. I think that happens sometimes, especially if they are waiting uh, at the bus stop with a stroller, there's no room in the buses. Sometimes they are passed up or there's no show. So those were the key concerns that we heard from women. And this convenience and comfort I do want to talk about, it's just the hygiene and the comfort they feel on the buses. So we do, did want to look into this because we want our women to have a pleasant experience when they get, into or get onto our system. Interestingly, um, the female rider satisfaction with metro on our buses has gone up, but on our rail, it's going down. And I have to say, key concern lines are red line, green line, blue line, were the key lines that we heard women have concerns with. So those are the things we'll be looking into. Uh, fewer than 40% of female riders felt transit is comfortable or transit has enough space for them. And this had to do with they could not bring, um, like I mentioned, strollers, even carts or bags onto a system. They felt like there wasn't enough space to accommodate all those things. So what are the next steps? Everybody, we have heard so much. This was our first, first key step in identifying how women are traveling on the system. We have collected a good amount of data to understand that. Our next step is developing a gender action plan. And as part of the gender action plan, our priority area would be safety. And as I mentioned, for safety, we have to find that balance. So we might be looking into transit ambassador programs where we don't have all these people on the train or buses riding a system in uniforms but it could be transit ambassadors who are there to watch out, who people can contact. So those are the things we want to explore as part of safety. For fair policy, we definitely want to look at uh, family tap cuts because that was a concern we heard. 
female traveling with four kids. She needs one tap card for each kid and herself. That's a concern. So fair policy and also looking at low income. Uh, and service provided by time of the day, we do want to adjust that service frequency, working with next gen bus study and trying to see how we can meet that midday service hour request. Station stop and vehicle design, definitely want to look at the escalators, elevators, how they're located on our stations and stop. Lighting is a key concern. And vehicle design, like I pointed out, re-looking at the configuration of our rail cars and buses so we can accommodate for packages, strollers, and make sure that our system is comfortable for all. And so with that, I would like to say thank you this is what we have done as part of our understanding how women travel, which was the first key step. It's a groundbreaking study. Uh, we've heard a lot of interest from other transit agencies, and we just want to get into the gender action plan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's give uh, Meghna another round of applause. I have to say thank you so much. As a woman, I can't tell you <laughs> how exciting it is to see studies focused on women. And after so, so many years that there's a focus on women and, and the 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 primary riders of these systems. I'm, I'm so delighted to see this effort is going on. And with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker who will be uh, Assistant City Manager of the City of Pasadena and woman that has been largely involved in Pasadena Transit. I think Julie uh, was around when Pasadena Transit was formed, uh, had an entirely different name. But uh, I was around at the same time, too, so uh, we're very proud of the consistency that Julius showed. So please join me in welcoming Assistant City Manager Julie Gutierrez. Thank you very much, Councilmember Coston. Um, appreciated that. And yes, I was here in 1994 uh, when we started this. I happened to be um, the acting uh, transportation administrator at that time. And you look back at it going, oh my gosh, is this gonna work? At that time, we had one bus route system. And we were looking to connect the downtown areas. So it was the old Pasadena to Playhouse to South Lake. And we looked at how do we attract people? Because at that time, one of the council goal was how do you circulate without cars? And so we wanted to meet that. But we also wanted to meet the fact that in 1994, we were gonna have the World Cup. And we had all these people here, and how do we get them to go, not just to Old Pasadena, but to our other business districts? Um, and so what we did on those buses is we wrapped them with kind of something that's enticing for people to wanna to get on. Um, Pasadena, we did one called the Symphony Bus. We did one called the New Year's Day Bus, the historical landmark. Um, and these buses would stop along, and I think, the, again, it was just the one route. Um, several years later, I know we started um, the Uptown route. I think that was 1994. Um, but uh, again, looking back at 1994, and yes, I have been here a long time, um, didn't know if this was gonna take. At that time, it was kind of like, okay, we'll try it. We'll be here for the World Cup. We're investing in this. We're gonna use our Prop A, Prop C, and we'll see what happens. And 25 years later, you look at this, and this is a primary service that our transportation department offers. When way back when it was, can it survive? Now it's like, oh no, how do we continue to grow and improve it? Um, and today, I believe we have six routes um, for, and 20 buses, and eventually, as the system keeps growing and adapting to Pasadena, these will be electric buses, and that's another goal we have in the future, because our council is very committed to sustainability and climate change. So what I'm about to do is introduce a video that was made um, to kind of give you a little bit of perspective of the um, Pasadena Transit. And I say Pasadena Transit, but back in 1994, way back when, um, it was called the, arts, the Pasadena Arts Bus. It was for Area Rapid Transit System. 
and several years ago we changed it to kind of modernize it and make it more um, accessible as a, for visitors coming in. Why would they take an arts bus? But they might take the Pasadena Transit. But I kept one of those nice little posters that said Pasadena Arts because I was there when we started it. So um, right now it's my pleasure to introduce a video, a little short video that we have um, talking about the history and, and the role that arts plays in the community. Thank you. I was just thinking if I had a car, because I noticed the traffic on the 210 freeway, I think I wouldn't even use the car just unless I had to go far away. The transit is just so convenient for me. I just love it. Everything's convenient. Las personas que manejan son muy amables. Siempre tratan de ayudarte. Te dan buena ubicación si tú tienes que irte a algún lugar. Es muy bueno ese servicio. There are a lot of benefits to having public transit um, as part of a larger transportation system. Uh, transit in and of itself provides opportunities and access for people who might otherwise not have access to a vehicle or to any other form of transportation. Pasadena Transit really is an essential part of the transportation network here in the city, it, it, the transportation ecosystem, if you will. We are a truly local service. Over 80% of our riders uh, live in Pasadena or just adjacent to Pasadena, and they represent the fabric of the community. And I really believe that it's part of the culture of the, piece, the people who live in Pasadena to take transit. It's been great, you know, bus drivers are really friendly, always on time, so, you know, never late for class. Put on this uniform every day so I can, you know, represent the city of Pasadena as well as my company here. Customer service, I think it's the most important thing because I think uh, it's because of them that I have this job. So whenever we're out there driving, uh, we're doing it all for them. For me, the best part when I feel I'm doing my job is when the customer comes to say, have a nice day, driver. For more than a million and a half passengers in Pasadena, Pasadena Transit is the way that we meet our local objective of letting people get around town without using their cars. It's been a pleasure to be part and to serve, to provide the service for our residents, our passengers, our community, our neighbors. We're truly helping, we're truly providing a service that people can use and get around. That was really great. I want to thank the transportation staff for putting that together. That was excellent.